Hello everyone. In this video, we'll be talking about variational autoencoders with the goal of explaining each and every aspect of its theory as well as implementation. Hopefully, by the end of this, you would have a better understanding of it. The plan for the video is to first talk about autoencoders and why do we even need VAEs if autoencoders exist. We'll then get into the intuition behind VAEs and the math which will guide us on how to exactly implement it. And finally, we'll have our VAE conditionally generate data. An autoencoder simply comprises of an encoder and a decoder. It's the encoder's responsibility to take an image and generate a lower dimension representation of the input. The decoder's responsibility is to take this lower dimension representation and generate an image from it. Once we train the autoencoder with reconstruction loss, which can be say L2 distance between pixels of both images, then the autoencoder will learn to reconstruct the given input. Before moving on to variational autoencoder, let's talk a bit about what problems an autoencoder could be used for. We can use autoencoders to convert our input to a lower dimensional latent space and using that as input features for other tasks instead of using the original higher dimensional input. We can also pre-train a network by having it act as an encoder and the reconstruction loss will ensure that the network learns to extract useful features from input. We could then simply throw away the decoder and fine tune the encoder on some downstream task. We could also use it as a denoising network by training the autoencoder to reconstruct the image from a noisy version of the input. This will end up teaching the network to denoise an image. Let's now get into why we need VAE. During training, autoencoder will try to push the training points as far apart from each other in the latent space. While that reduces the reconstruction loss, it does not provide any guarantee that all points in the latent space will generate valid images. When we zoom in at the learned latent space, we find that not all regions of the space are able to generate an image. And indeed, a random latent point will most likely generate a completely invalid image. The second issue is that we cannot generate new variations of data from it. Since we do not have any knowledge of distribution of points in the latent space, we can't really sample points from the latent space. And furthermore, autoencoder will have difficulty in generating variations of data that it hasn't seen because it would have most likely memorized the mapping. We are going to try and fix these problems and in process transition from autoencoders to variational autoencoders. Let's first try to tackle the inability of autoencoder to generate valid images from any latent point. Up till now, we were encoding images to a point in latent space. What if instead we encode each image as a distribution of points in the latent space? The hope being that if the distribution of each point is large enough, the encoding process of all training images would allow us to capture the entire latent region. Another way to look at this could be that we are demanding the network to learn to encode the image to such a distribution, different samples from which generate different variations, which are not exactly like the input, but close enough because of the reconstruction loss. However, when we actually make that change, things don't really go as we desire. Since there is no reason for the autoencoder to keep these distributions wide, it collapses them to a single point by predicting variances to a very small value, as that way it can do much better on the reconstruction loss, since for each input image, it would only have to learn to reconstruct that image from a single latent point rather than a wide distribution of points. And these are further pushed apart, leading us to the exact same state as before. We must constrain the distributions in a manner that disables the encoder from collapsing those to a single point and they are also constrained to not move far apart from each other. With these two objectives, we can see that if we demand these distributions to be similar to a standard Gaussian, then that will allow us to achieve both objectives. The network will try to have their means as close to zero as possible, hence disabling the distribution to move far apart from each other. And it will try to have their variances as close to unit variance as possible again disabling the network from reducing the variance and collapsing the distributions to a singular point. To add this factor, we need to compute some sort of a distance metric between the distribution that encoder returns and standard Gaussian. We do this by computing KL divergence between these two. 
which is one such metric that captures what we want. I'll make sure to add links in the description where you can read more about it. Once we add this, we see that as we increase the relative importance of KL divergence as compared to reconstruction loss, our latent space distributions end up being wide enough and covering the entire space. We can also reach the same conclusion with the use of a probabilistic model of data. Let's assume our data x is generated by a hidden variable z, which are points in the latent space. In order to generate data, we first sample from the latent space using a prior pz. We then generate a data point by sampling from the distribution p of x given z. Earlier, we did not know how to sample from z. To simplify the sampling process and the generation process, we will now make some assumptions. We assume P of Z to be a standard Gaussian, which will allow easy sampling. We also assume P of X given Z to be a Gaussian, the mean of which is defined by a function f, which we will approximate through our decoder, and it has a covariance matrix which is just a constant times identity. Both of these assumptions will simplify the generation process. Our set of input images, x, does not give us any information regarding the hidden variables or the latent factors which are used to generate. In order to learn to encode the image in the latent space, we need to be able to infer characteristics of z given an input image, and for that, we need p of z given x. Computing p of z given x using Bayes' theorem requires marginalizing z in the denominator. This involves an integration over all possible latent sources of radiation z. And for higher dimensional z, either we can't compute this integral or we can't compute it in polynomial time. I'll add links explaining this also in description. So instead, we try to find an approximation q of z given x, which we define to be a member of the Gaussian family. Obviously, the actual distribution might be nothing like a Gaussian, but we try to find as close an approximation as we can, and we do that by finding such a member of the Gaussian family that minimizes the distance between q of z given x and p of z given x. We use the KL divergence as the metric that we want to minimize, which is nothing but this. We have used summations here, but given the distributions are continuous, it would be integral. So we can just replace summations with that everywhere. Applying Bayes' theorem of, on p of z given x gives us this. We then expand all the terms in the numerator and denominator. The last term is nothing but a constant and can be ignored as far as optimizing q of z given x is concerned. We then bring the q of z and p of z terms together and rewrite the first term as KL divergence and the second term as expectation of log p of x given z. Because we assume p of x given z to be a Gaussian, we get the formulation of reconstruction as mean squared error. Finally, we reach the same conclusion. A KL divergence term between Q of Z and P of Z, which we assume to be a standard Gaussian, and a reconstruction loss term that we are trying to minimize. To summarize, we make the following changes. Instead of encoding input to a point, we encode input to a distribution by predicting its mean and variance. We then sample from this distribution and pass the sample latent point to the decoder, which generates an image which is fed to the reconstruction loss, which is nothing but the MSE between the input and the generated image. We also add a KL divergence term to the loss, which ensures that Q of Z given X is as close to a standard Gaussian as possible. Up till now, we have been able to generate data, but we don't have any control over what the network generates. Given that we might have class labels available with us, like in the case of digits, let's see how we can conditionally generate data so that when we ask the network to generate an image of a particular class, it indeed generates an image of that class only. To achieve this, we will add label information in the encoder as well as decoder. Instead of the encoder learning Q of Z given X, it will now learn Q of Z given X, Y. For our conditional encoder, since we are working with digits, our number of classes are 10. So we will add 10 channels to the input image with all being zero. Then, we will replace the label index channel with all ones. So for 0, it will be the first channel, for number 4, it will be the fifth channel, and for number 9, it will be the tenth channel. Essentially, what we are doing is concatenating a one-hot encoded label vector for each pixel value. 
for zero, it will be this vector that's concatenated to all pixels of the input image. For four, this, and for nine, this. Similarly, we'll add this class information in the decoder as well. Instead of just passing the sample Z, we'll also feed the decoder a one hot label vector by concatenating that to the sample Z. Prior to conditioning, this is how our entire flow of VAE was looking. Now, we add the label information in the encoder and even the decoder gets that information. Once we train this, we are going to see that because we are feeding the label information, the latent space need not encode any class specific information. Rather class agnostic information like stroke width, direction of tilt, width of the digit, etc. might be encoded in the latent space. Which is why from all regions of the latent space, we can generate all numbers by changing only the label information. Like here, we see that top right regions have numbers tilted towards top right. Bottom left have numbers tilted towards top left. In center, the numbers have thin strokes. And in the top left, we see numbers more and more looking like one. And in the bottom right, numbers start looking more like zero. With this, we come to the end of this video. This would be a two part video, where in this part one, I talked about autoencoders, why we need variational autoencoders, and how to arrive at its objective intuitively and mathematically. And finally, we saw how to have BAEs conditionally generate data. In the next part, we'll implement BAE from scratch. Thank you for watching the video, and in case you learned something from it, do press the like button and subscribe to the channel.